and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. For this week's podcast, I'm at Kabila, a beautiful haven of peace and calm in the Cornish countryside with an ancient rainforest, wildflower meadow, beavers and Gloria the pig. Actually, also two golden Labradors and birds and bees buzzing around because you've probably noticed I'm outside. I have come to hear the story of how a dynamic couple who were both deeply affected by mental illness changed their lives and turned to the restorative powers of nature to help them heal. Merlin Hanbury Tennyson grew up in Kabila on Bodmin Moor. He served as a British Army major for eight years and worked for another eight years in the heart of London, but had a breakdown in 2017 due to post-traumatic stress disorder. And his wife Lizzie, a high-flying senior leadership executive for brands like Green and Black, Charlotte Tilbury, Clinique and Boots experienced burnout and then postnatal anxiety after the birth of the couple's first child. Together they've created not only a relaxing space for them, which has changed their lives dramatically, but they organise retreats where stressed out, worn out people, some of them military, some nurses, can come to recharge and reconnect with nature. And Lizzie also freelances as a brand consultant. It is lovely to meet you both in such a magical setting. Merlin, you grew up in Kabila, didn't you? This place must be very very special to you, I'm imagining. I did. And thank you for that introduction, Helen. That was lovely. I spent my childhood running wild through the forest here long before anyone was using the term temperate rainforest and long before we even knew how special this place was. My father and I always felt that it was special and Lizzie and I always certainly felt that it was very special as well. But the more we've learned about it, we've realized just how special this valley is. And what is a temperate rainforest? That's a great question. And, and something which a few years ago, I think, was very little understood. I do a lot of rainforest tours through our valley. And I always ask people at the start how many people had never heard of temperate rainforest or didn't know that we had rainforests in the UK. And it's still 60 to 70 percent of most groups who've never heard of it as a habitat. It used to be called Atlantic wet woodland, ancient oak woodland, W17 woodland, if you want to get technical under the Forestry Commission's designations. And so it's a habitat that's designated by a number of things. One is the amount of rainfall it receives. So here in this peninsula jutting out into the Atlantic, we get more than our fair share. And you need to have at least 1400 millimeters a year of rainfall that falls across the year. It can't all fall in one big dump in December. However easy that would be for the rest of the year, it has to fall a little bit every month. Then you have the native composure of the, the habitat. So it's 80% oak trees in this forest, sessile oak, the Celtic oak, which is a wonderfully told you and romantic creature that can live for up to a thousand years. These oak trees, they take 300 years to grow. They can live for up to 400 years. They then take 300 years to die and rot back down into the soil. And then you have a lot of hazel, willow, holly, rowan as the ruderal species in the, the mid, mid canopy. But then the main thing that designates it is the epiphytes that live amongst the canopy. So these are any plant species that don't use soil to survive. So anything that grows out of a tree, so lichens, mosses, polypody ferns, lots of fungus, liverworts and pennyworts. A, a single oak tree can have up to 600 species living on it at any one time. These aren't single organisms, their their community structures, their cities. And it's that incredible riot and, and, and abundance of biodiversity which designates these as temperate rainforests and makes them one of the best habitats that we have in the UK for amazing things like the fight against climate change. They sequester carbon at a higher rate than any other habitat that we can restore and protect in the UK. They return the ecosystem services that we used to take for granted things like clean water, soil health, soil erosion, flood prevention, drought prevention. These are facilitated by our rainforest better than anything else. But something which Lizzie and I are passionate about and, and have felt firsthand is that they're also the best habitat that we have in the UK for the mental health and well-being of the people who spend time amongst them because of the incredible, not only the cultural home that we have in them, but also the amazing volatile organic compounds that these trees secrete throughout the photosynthetic process, which we're studying more and more have a marked physiological impact on the humans that breathe them in, which can do huge things for our, our health and well-being. Wow, gosh, what a description. Lizzie, <laughs> these ancient woods sound magical and I know they've, they're really important to you too, aren't they? What does it feel like when you're out in that kind of terrain and breathing it all in and taking all the different species in? I think it feels a bit like time travel. You sort of feel like you could be stepping into any number of great books or myths or legends, looking at the sort of craggy oaks and the kind of lichens and the moss dripping off them. It does honestly feel like you're stepping back into some sort of mythical Arthurian land. I think for me, it was just the exposure to the green 
And that's something that we kind of really cherish on a daily basis. And we're so lucky to live amongst it. You know, the green all around, the calmness of that, the serenity of that and the purity of the air. You know, we have lichens that grow here that you'll never find anywhere like a city or a town. They need the purest of air to survive and grow. Old man's beard is one that we have that's along so many of our oak trees in the woods. And it literally looks like a scraggly knot of beard growth all going up and down trees. I mean, it really adds the kind of magical dynamics of the scene. Wow. So it's beautiful. We're so lucky. You say you're lucky, but you both made a very conscious decision for reasons that we'll explore perhaps in a minute to have a complete change of life and come back to what are Merlin's roots here mm. on, on Bodmin Moor. But just for our listeners, I have the benefit of sitting in this setting and having a look at the retreat space you've created. Can you describe, Lizzie, what you've actually created here in terms of the retreat space and, and what you do here? Yeah, of course. So the setting that we're in today, we're in the middle of Bodmin Moor, which is this wild landscape littered with craggy granite outposts and gnarled, withered trees and masses of purple heather. It's very, very wild. It's very, very raw nature. And I think my intention behind the design of the retreat space was to create somewhere that sort of took the edge off the wilderness and enabled people to feel really safe and comfortable with us here. So I looked at lots of biophilic design, how we could bring nature inside. So the great big glass windows that we have, the hanging planters full of sweetheart vines and Boston ferns that sort of spill out and I suppose welcome you on arrival. I looked a lot at trauma inspired designs. So did you? Yeah, there's quite a movement of that in the States happening particularly. And it's lots of clean lines, big open spaces, but gentle materials and furnishings. So our sheepskin rugs, for example, that kind of plays back to our founding story in the word Kabila, which means woolen cloak. Lots of gentle textures, nature-informed palettes. So the, the lichen that I described, Old Man's Beard, that's an incredible kind of serene green colour. So the entire palette was inspired from that. So really just creating a sort of gentle nature-inspired surroundings to cocoon you from the world. That's a great description and you do feel when you walk in here, you definitely feel connected to nature, even when you're in the inside. The, the materials, the woods, the stones that you've chosen are very soothing almost. It feels like Bodmin Moor's sort of taken you into its heart somehow just when you arrive. So I can imagine on a retreat that would be very, very special. This has set you up very nicely for the woolen cloak story <laughs> there, Merlin. What's the woolen cloak story? Well, you asked just before we started, Helen, whether we pronounce it Kabila or Kabia. And we get this a lot from people inquiring about coming to stay here who think it, because it looks like it must be a Spanish name. And there's a wonderful saying in Cornwall, which is that Trey, Paul and Penn spell the names of Cornish men because many place names start with the prefix Trey, Paul and Penn, which are ancient Cornish words because Cornwall is not a part of England. As anyone who lives down here will know, we're one of the seven Celtic nations and one of the last outposts of that Celtic cultural history and identity. And we have our ancient language, Cornish, and in that tray means homestead or farm, pole means harbour or pool, and, and pen means headland. And so any place that starts with those three words, you know there's going to be a farm there, a headland there, or a, or a harbour. Polzeth. Penzance, Pentire, Trilisic, Trewithen. And then Kabila sounds very different, but it is, as Lizzie said, it, it means the land of the woolen cloak. When William the Conqueror came and took over these lands in 1066, Cornwall was still an independent, autonomous nation ruled by our last king, King Caddock of Cornwall, our last Celtic ruler. William the Conqueror killed him and gave all of Cornwall to his brother, Robert de Mortain, who became the first Duke of Cornwall. And when they did their great census, the Doomsday Census in 1086, they established that there were 139 ancient farms across Cornwall, which each had a certain duty that the steward of that land had to do for, for the Duke. And Kabila's, the land of the woolen cloak, was that whenever the Duke crosses from England into Cornwall, we have to take our finest sheep, shear it, make a woolen cloak, and present it to the Duke at the border to keep them warm and dry from the occasional rain that we get down here on Bodmin Moor. And when Lizzie and I were learning about that and coming up with the concept of what we wanted to do here at Kabila, we really wanted to imbue that origin story really at the heart of what our business was, which is around making sure that everyone who stays here feels wrapped up, warm, safe and dry, and that they are in a safe space, whether that's just because they need an escape from their busy lives, whether it's because they have trauma that they're working through, or whether they're just trying to get away from it all and have a bit of a disconnect and a, a detox. And so everyone who comes here should feel very wrapped up and very safe. I am fascinated to hear your personal journeys because, Lizzie, you 
worked as a corporate executive, we named brands in that introduction, brands I love like Charlotte Tilbury yeah. and <laughs> Green and Black, another favourite. It sounds like you had a very dynamic career, very successful career, but can you share a bit about your story and, and what happened and why you've walked away from that? What was the story behind you coming and wanting to set up a beautiful place like this? I feel so privileged to have had a fantastic career and worked for lots of different really kind of magnetic founders and I feel like every role that I've had learning from the incredible business of Joe Fairley and Craig Sams at Green and Blacks being in the same room as the Lauders at Clinique uh, learning from Charlotte Tilbury who's she's a force of nature quite frankly she really really is and I think for me you know we were on a journey trying to have children and everything just was not flowing. It wasn't flowing. It took us a while to to have children. I had two miscarriages, one quite a late one and kind of early, but they're both equally as horrible. And I think I just realized that I needed to take some time and really connect to my body again, because I was almost having an out-of-body experience. You know, I was running on this mad pace and totally disconnected. And then the pandemic happened and we came down here. We packed up our house in 24 hours and we were down in Cornwall. I'd already sort of made the decision that I wanted to slow down and then everything kind of happened in sequence. It all just seemed to flow. We'd obviously had, you know, Merlin's experience with a breakdown a few years before that. And I think it just clicked into gear. I think when we were working on our restoration efforts down here anyway, so working, looking at how we can really be responsible guardians of the land, uh, working on our first project about beavers, we sort of had this click moment of going, okay, well, we've both had struggles. How can we make sure that we're not just guardians of the land and looking to restore the land, but how can we create a place that restores people as well? And so that was the sort of big turning point, I think. And then the pandemic happened and it was just this wild ride of isolation, having children on our own, literally in the middle of nowhere with no, no support. Postnatal anxiety and depression happened for me, intertwined with a lot of guilt because obviously it had taken a lot of time to get pregnant and to have a baby. And then I was feeling horrible in a very dark place. But I had this incredible pocket of light that came to me in the woods and an inspiration actually for future things that I wanted to work on, how we can really open our place up and support more people. I don't think it was really one specific moment. I think it was a shift change of just knowing that actually my purpose didn't lie in London anymore. It didn't lie for those kind of big businesses anymore. It lay working with people down here and creating space for people down here and creating careers for people in our community as well. I feel so passionately about that. It wasn't sort of one moment. It was, I guess, a real, it was a real journey. It sounds like a cliche, but it really, really was. No, it doesn't at all. And when you felt in in that dark place, was there also a realisation that when you got out perhaps into the ancient woods that you started to feel better and that the, the green and the air and the outdoors and nature started to help heal you? Was there a sense of that, do you think? 100%. I'm always sort of reticent to say that it was only that. I mean, I was I was in therapy every week. I was talking to somebody. I was in a really dark place. But part of that treatment was, she said, look, you've got to practice what you preach when you're experiencing a mental health condition that really separates you from who you are. You feel like you're having an out-of-body experience from your mind. You have to do everything possible to ground yourself and she just said, look, you've got to get into the woods every single day. Stop isolating yourself. Try and get out for a walk every day. So I did that. And some days I'd have an amazing walk and I'd notice everything and I'd be really in the mix of the forest and the bird song and the, the sound of the river rushing. And some days I'd walk and I'd just cry. But every single day helped me. And I have absolutely no doubt that that rhythm and that rhythm of daily immersion in nature supported me back to myself. Absolutely no doubt. Merlin, may I ask what happened to you and tell us a bit about your life as an army major? I think in the same way, similar to Lizzie's story, there are multiple elements to it. And it's always nice. You know, we always strive, I think, as people for simple answers and simple solutions to problems. But for me, it was also varied. I, I did three tours in Afghanistan in my time in the military. And I feel lucky to have lived as a soldier at a time when it was quite busy and it was quite active and there were lots of opportunities to do some of the things that certainly as a younger person you you want to do. But some of that involved doing things that did come back to me afterwards. So I was blown up in a roadside bomb and we just had a very active time while we were out there. And I was very lucky to come away with all my limbs and with all my soldiers intact as well. And it wasn't until 10 years after that, in 2017, a lot of these incidents happened, 2007, 2008, 2009. And then in 2017, a decade later, Lizzie and I were married. I was working in London. 
for a large management consultancy firm, which again pushes people to levels where burnout is very, very common to the point where it's actually an accepted reality within the business. And I was shocked when I found this out that many of these companies have an acceptable rate of people suffering from quite bad mental health conditions as a result of the work they're being asked to do by those companies. I believe the, the, the acceptable rate should be zero always, and it isn't, it's quite high. And I did have a very nasty period where I just lost any side of who I was as a person and fell into a bout of bad depression and PTSD. And just as Lizzie says, I would never say that Kabila was the only thing that helped me. I, I went through the, the clinical healing process as well with various uh, processes and, uh, and talking therapy, but certainly having Kabila at this valley here to escape to every weekend for as long as I was able to when I was taking time away from work was hugely part of that healing journey. And we both had this, and it was more of a drawn out epiphany than a sudden thunderbolt moment. But we had this moment where we realized that it was wrong, that we were the only two people really healing and benefiting from this space and that we should open up to as many as possible. But we had to do that in a way which put this very precious habitat first. And so we wanted to bring as many people in as possible. And there are wonderful examples of beautiful parts of the English countryside and other areas of temperate rainforest, some of them which no one's ever allowed to go into because they're just protected for nature. And some of them which have footpaths running through them, Wisman's Wood is always the famous one, which have actually been very badly damaged because they get overused by people who aren't aware of how to interact properly with the natural world. And we wanted to be in the middle of that where we could bring as many people as possible who really needed to heal into this valley, but always make sure that the rainforest and, and all the other creatures that live within it were, were put first. First. You kind of glossed over, you, you were blown up at the roadside and sort of dismissed that, that away. Again, can I ask if that's what caused a lot of the post-traumatic stress? Is that something that is such a horror to happen and perhaps you bury it? somewhere at the time and you don't deal with it would you say that was perhaps at the heart of what happened to you i remember when i was doing my training for my first tour in afghanistan i did some trauma risk management some courses where they taught you a bit about ptsd and this was back in 2006 and i remember them saying at the time that after a traumatic incident it can take up to 10 years for the impact of that to manifest I remember vividly sitting in the lecture hall listening to that at the time and thinking how ridiculous that sounded and how if something happened to me, I, I'd know instantly, at least within a few weeks, if I was going to be unwell as a result of it. And I was always very happy with the fact that I'd been through some of these instances and it certainly wasn't just the roadside bomb. There were also a lot of other what we call contacts in the military, you know, incidents, battles, things happened, which fundamentally, if they weren't damaging to me, then it would be strange. And, and and I always often say this to people I was in Afghanistan with, people who I suspect may be going through their own trauma, who I want to talk to about things I've been through and also help them to perhaps open up about things they've gone through, is that some of the things that we did out there, if you're not a little bit damaged afterwards, then that's a bit more worrying. That's more worrying than... There yeah. are natural things for us to have to do. So yeah, certainly the, the roadside, the way it wasn't a roadside bomb, it was, a, it was an IED, an improvised explosive device that was laid purposefully for me to drive over, for our vehicles to drive over. But that was definitely a big factor, but there were many others as, as part of it as well. And when you came here during the pandemic and we all locked down and, and you were locked down here... What was your experience of beginning to heal here? I, I get the sense that for Lizzie, the woods were really, really important. But what, what happened to you in this environment that made you start to, to feel better? The forest was a huge part for me as well. And, and we both spent a lot of time in there together. But our first big project was releasing beavers into this habitat, which I found hugely exciting. And I think that task or that task oriented element of healing the natural world, but also healing ourselves, I find that really resonates with me. So I find it really positive to do things which help as well. And I think that's often the case, especially for veterans I talk to is the retreats we do will have elements of just being in the natural world, but also elements of helping to restore. So helping us to plant, we're tripling the size of the rainforest here and planting 100,000 trees. People can come and be a part of that by helping to plant those trees, restore that natural world, be a part of returning the absent species that are so important. Things like beavers, wildcats, pine martins, all of these species that we're missing, which are all keystone species and are so important to this habitat functioning healthily. And so learning about that and then being a part of implementing it and joining the national conversation, which is now so vibrant and exciting. For me, that's all been very healing as well. And why beavers? And what do beavers do? Because I'm sure there's a beaver story there. And how long have you got? Right? Yeah. <laughs> oh God, are we going to get him going, Lizzie? Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll try not to. I can, I can definitely <laughs> chat about beavers for a long time because they're, they're such a wonderful creature. And 
And they're often the start point for the return of native but absent species because they are so easy to understand from that basis. They're a keystone species, so they hold whole sections of the web of life up and, and provide opportunities by creating ecosystems that don't otherwise exist. They're quite large. So our male, um, Jean-Claude Van Damme, is, is, 20, <laughs> Jean -Claude Van Damme. is 23 kilos. Uh, our female, Sigourney, is a little smaller. They're big creatures. They're also very easy to see. They're quite gregarious and, and not too shy of humans. So they're a wonderful way to educate people and for people to engage with. And I think that makes them a very attractive species to bring in. There are wonderful things like glowworms and pool frogs and, and also things like wildcats and pine martens, which are very romantic creatures, but you're not going to see them because when they're in the habitat, they disappear and they're always going to see us first. And you might see their droppings or you know some sign or a kill, but you're very rarely going to see the animal itself. Whereas beavers are wonderful because they're so important. You put them in and within months you see the change and you see health returning to the environment. But they're also very easy for us to learn from and engage with, which is a really wonderful element as well. Your children are now one and three and you've got your Labradors and your beavers and Gloria the pig. I think Gloria, Gloria the, the pig, pig's yeah. here too, isn't she? Are you feeling now, Lizzie, in a much better place? And can you look back on your time in the corporate world as a happy time in your life and a challenging time? But are you feeling that you're just happier now with the second stage of your career, if you like? Oh, definitely. I don't think I've ever been as happy. I can remember when we got married and it was almost in the small print of the wedding agreement that you will m move to the middle of nowhere in Bod Bodmin Moor, that's going to be your future. And I thought, oh my God, how is that going to work? Because I thought in my mind, okay, I'm going to be this person. I, I'm fascinated by business. I'm fascinated by product development and the science that goes into that. How am I going to make that work? Okay, well, I'm going to set up a consultancy and commute between London. And actually, I've never been happier or more fulfilled running our business and creating this world. Nature is the ultimate inspiration. You never get bored. There's a new plant to look at. There's a new species to understand. There's a new pattern of growth emerging in the rainforest. It's the most creative I think I've ever felt. And I think also, you know, when you're working for other people, and especially for me, I've worked for some seriously inspirational founders that I've learned so much from. It was an amazing experience, but there's nothing quite like feeling that energy of doing it on your own and the you know the risk reward it's such a tightrope it's a daily oh my god sometimes but it's incredible I wouldn't change it for the world and you are creating because you're creating some products here aren't you I know you can't talk too deeply about it but <laughs> tell me a little bit the, the big ticket line about what you're actually trying to create here from nature and from the forest I think it's how we can take the beneficial elements of our really unique rainforest chemistry and give them to people so they can experience them in their own home. And I've been working for the last three years with some really incredible researchers and scientists and perfumers and development experts on how to do that. So hopefully next year I can talk to you a bit more about it, but it's been an incredible learning journey and an obsession, to be quite honest, an obsession, but a wonderful one, a glorious one. I was lucky enough to go on a retreat with a Actually, a lady who's running it that I've known since she was eight years old. And when we were on the Pilates platform on the last night, she gave everybody a little tiny bottle of essential oil and a wooden block. And the idea was to close our eyes and just feel like the peace and the nourishment we'd felt from the retreat when we smelt that essence, the essential oil, and then to bring it home. And then sometimes before bed, now I just shut my eyes and it takes me back to that the wonderful woods and forests and things. I'm fascinated. I always think, Merlin, that retreats I feel guilty I'm lucky I go on a few I go on a few press trips and I always feel blessed and I always feel it sounds a luxury it was really music to my ears when I arrived today to hear that some of the people that come to your retreats are service men and women and nurses and people who really do need what you have to offer rather than for me sometimes it's just a little bit of luxury and a few minutes to breathe away from the rat race. Tell us about the kinds of retreats and the people that come here. I mean, we're certainly open to everybody coming here and we have a whole range of, of groups from a lot of businesses and organisations who want to bring their teams here either to just spend time away from their daily activities or to do their strategy work, their team building. And we've created a space that's wonderful for them to do that. We also have a lot of the traditional wellness groups with breathwork and yoga and Pilates groups as well. And so we're certainly not closed off to those groups and, and they are a, a huge part of what we do and we love working with them. But certainly for Lizzie and me, I think working with some of the groups which were the inspiration for why we wanted to start Kabila 
has been really wonderful. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've started working more with the veteran community. So we work predominantly with the US military. Actually, I, I long to work more with the British military as a British veteran, but the Americans tend to have more funding and also more imagination. And so they've, they've been able to, we've been able to get them to come here more readily. And the change is huge, but also working with the NHS and the Florence Nightingale Foundation have been a huge partner of ours. And they are the most incredible charity that supports NHS nurses to bring groups of burnt out and stressed and very damaged senior nurses who've been working through the COVID pandemics and suffering all of the challenges that the NHS has faced through that. And there's a lot of similarity. You know, people often put veterans in, the, in a bucket on their own, but I think the stresses that people see in the NHS compared to the stresses that people from the military see, there's, there's a lot of crossover. We also uh, work more with groups of people with identified traumas that they're bringing here as a group as well. For me, I, I think that the, the wellness groups, people come here knowing how wonderful this work can be. They're probably already doing some work on themselves. They already love nature. And so you definitely see a transformation and an improvement in them throughout the course of the three or four days that they're here, but they're already on their journey. The wonderful thing is when people come here who don't know they need the help, they're very uncomfortable. They don't like nature or they don't think they like nature. And at the start, at the opening circle, at the beginning, they're very closed off, very kind of, no, 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 I, this isn't for me. I wouldn't normally be here. And then after three days of all working together, at the end, as they leave, they have gone just from zero to hero and seeing that huge heart opening and and that huge change. That's, I think, where the real work happens. Uh, and that's I'm so fascinated exciting. that you're working with the US military and and at the minute, not the British military, because I wouldn't imagine there's that much help and support out there for veterans here. So it would seem a very obvious connect. But what kind of changes do you see in the US military people? That 10 year incubation that PTSD can have, you know, we've now left Afghanistan, broadly left Iraq, but we put so many people from the Army, Navy, Air Force and the Marines through those two operational environments that it's only now that the aftermath of all of the mental health challenges that we're likely to see as a society from that are going to start to manifest. And therefore, the British military, the British government does need to do an awful lot more to look after its serving people but, and its veterans as well. And so I think that the time is now. We have a number of irons in the fires with the British, with the MOD and with uh, the British military and British military charities. And I'm hopeful that some of them will see the efficacy of this. In terms of the changes that we see, it's wonderful seeing how different types of practice will work for different people. So we do a lot of somatic therapy work with a, an incredible practitioner called Pippa Richardson, who we partner with very closely here and is What wonderful. is somatic therapy? Pippa would be the best person to answer that. But it, it, for me, the, the way I understand it is it's a, a form of movement practice that helps people to process and release trauma that they have held inside their body. And so often the, the, the body keeps the score. You know, we, the things that we feel psychologically are all held physically within us will often have physical pain or be repressing a certain trauma in a certain part of our body. And the work that she does helps people to release that trauma and to move through it as well. So it's a very beautiful thing to watch. You know, obviously there's some yoga and Pilates, but what are the perhaps more unusual things that Kabila offers? Well, there's one thing I wanted to add in terms of the groups of people that we work with that I feel tremendously passionate about, which is working with young founders and founders who are starting their businesses. And one of the reasons that we wanted to do this was to work more in the kind of corporate space and work with those who are sort of willing to look differently at their culture and how they're working with their people. And the real beauty of working with founders is that they're just starting to cultivate that culture for their business, for that kind of mindset that kind of echoes around their business. So it's wonderful to get them at their kind of early stages. So working with sort of seed scale up founders is really wonderful. So we're partnering with a company called And Rising who work very much in that space. Um, they're a sort of creative agency. And I think they'd also describe themselves as a kind of venture capital incubator. But also we do something called a dirty weekend. I've heard about your dirty so. weekend. Isn't that where <laughs> there's some uh, tree planting involved in the, the dirty true. bits? It's I got quite planting. excited when I saw dirty yeah. weekend on your website. It's like, yeah. great name. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of an introduction to coming on retreat. So I wanted to do something which was maybe a bit more available to people. Didn't feel so all consuming as a kind of yoga and wellness experience, which I think can sometimes feel a bit intimidating to people. So you come here and you experience a kind of taster of everything. So you have a beautiful meditation and movement class. You'll come and you'll have a sound bath. I'm very passionate about working with sound. We have an amazing sound healer called Janie. 
Uh, she spends half her life in India, which is so annoying because I want her to be here <laughs> she all needs the to time. Be here. She needs to be here all the time. <laughs> I have one every day if I could. So you'll experience a beautiful sound bath. You'll come and do some dips in the river, cold water immersion, barefoot walking. And then everybody as a group plants a tree together. And you'll be held here and looked after by our incredible hosts. We have wonderful private chefs. Kate Munro, she does this beautiful kind of chakra inspired menu. So everything goes through this rhythm of the chakras, which is this old system of healing and awareness. So it's the sort of best of what we have to offer packaged up in a tongue-in-cheek approach, I guess. We were shooting it, actually, we shot the campaign for it with this wonderful, wonderful photographer called Gary Didsbury, who spends his time shooting Hermes and Chanel lipsticks. And I had to go to the post office and send up this moss and twigs. So, because I wanted a bit of Cabilla in the shoot, and this rogue snail went up with him. So, our little <laughs> snail from Cornwall went up and was in the shoot. But yeah, dirty weekends. And then the pig as well. We've just done a really, really fantastic collaboration with the pig called Ground and Grow. And, you know, it's obviously a tremendous honor to be working with them. We're in our second year of business. I met their commercial director, pitched them an idea, which they loved. And we're now working with them to do a kind of slightly cosier, slightly slightly more luxury, I'd say, experience where people can come down to Cornwall, stay at the pig and then come here and I guess have a wilder exposure to nature. And what about Lizzie for you when you see very stressed out, burnt out nurses come or people from the military? What transformations do you see and how much joy does that give you when you see stressed out person arriving and perhaps a slightly different character leaving. So much joy, kind of levitating amounts of joy. And it's the reason why we do it. It's the reason I think why most of our team enjoy working here, because that energy shift in people is just, it's so inspiring to see that people have been humble enough to have a new experience, a different experience and let themselves go into it fully. One of the things that we did from the start was something called Kabila Mail. And Kabila Mail is, it's how we sort of get our feedback. I didn't want to have this kind of, you know, boggy digital process. I wanted to find a way of getting people's authentic experience back to the teams. So it's these little postcards that we leave for everyone. And we just ask them to write a few words. And for the US military, for the Florence Nightingale Foundation, we've had people say things like, I haven't been able to breathe for two years and now I can breathe. And, you know, this, this experience has changed my life. This experience has made me interested in trees. This experience has made me learn about the different types of trees that we have in the UK. You know, things like that, things that where you're inspiring people's learning. It's just, it's awesome. I don't really have a succinct description for it. I'm a very overexcitable person. So when I see these changes in people, I can't wait to talk about it and tell people. But that's almost the next step. It's that ripple of calm and it's that ripple of joy. So when someone leaves here, they then have an interaction with another human. And that might mean that they're in a slightly kinder, calmer place. And that's the thing that I think really excites us, isn't it? I know now because Merlin told me that weather in Cornwall comes in from the West. (laughs) As we've been talking, I've desperately been trying to make my notes not flutter in the breeze. And there's a really looming grey cloud that's kind of working its way. So I'll start to wind up. But I'm just wondering, Merlin, when you look at your previous lives, both of your previous lives and now what you're doing... The question is, in a way, what you did in your old lives, it's in some ways seems to have set you up beautifully for this because when people walk through your door, particularly you perhaps have got some post-traumatic stress or have been through burnout, Lizzie, like you did, you actually understand and have an understanding of what might help and what they might need. So how do you look back on the old careers and is that really just part of your story now? There's a wonderful saying that Lizzie taught me, which is that when you look forwards, it looks like spaghetti. And when you look backwards, it looks like a straight line. And it's always easy to sort of see that kind of inevitability of the path that we've taken up until now. But we were lucky to stumble upon all of the wonderful people who partner and work with us. That has helped us to get to where we are. I wouldn't change a single thing of what happened to me. I don't think Lizzie would change anything that's happened to her, even though a lot of it was very painful for both of us because it's helped us to get to the place that we are and to be able to create what we're doing for people. And then for me, as I look forward, we recently managed to form the charity, the Thousand Year Trust, which is focused on tripling the amount of temperate rainforest across the UK, not just in our one valley. And we're working with some of the top researchers, top universities, 
and working with some incredible people to not only champion this habitat, but also make sure that it becomes nationally recognized and is nationally protected. And that suddenly becomes really important work, really important work, which is much bigger than anything we're doing or anything that we thought we might have done. And and that's all because of the experiences that we've had up until now. We've been ending all our podcasts this season asking about risk. And I know you took a massive risk, I would imagine, when you decided to up sticks and throw away, not throw away, but leave corporate worlds and all of that kind of life behind. That doesn't have to be the answer, Lizzie, but what is the biggest risk that you've taken in your life, would you say? Maybe (laughs) marrying a Cornishman. (laughs) (laughs) Marrying a Cornishman from Bodmin Moor. (laughs) Um, No, we were talking about this and there have been so many. We've lived very full lives, I think, up to this point, which is fantastic. But we didn't have cash kicking about to do this. So we had to take some very, very serious financial risks to do this. And we took out a ginormous loan against our home to make this happen. So it was sort of great in a way because we knew that it had to work. Like there was absolutely no way that we could allow any sense of failure into the mix because if this doesn't work, we kind of lose everything. So it's I think that's the biggest risk. That's for what me about anyway. You, no, it's, it's a great, it's a great <laughs> motivator. And, and as Lizzie says, that everything that we, you know, the old expression is to bet the farm. We had to do that. We had to put everything that we are sitting amongst now into debt, so that we'd be able to build where we're sitting and create these experiences. And that that is still very much hanging over us, which is a motivator every day. And so I, I'd agree. That's. Um, I definitely wouldn't say it was a risk marrying Lizzie. That was the, <laughs> the, the smartest thing I ever did. Well, she but said no. it was a risk marrying you, man. <laughs> exactly. No, I, wouldn't, I won't risk it. But no, well, it was, maybe uh, turn the mics off. <laughs> maybe there'll be a walk in the woods where that one gets resolved. <laughs> it's been really wonderful to meet you both. I'm kind of hoping that I can just move into one of your little, well, I don't know what you call them, beautiful uh, pods. Call them or coits. Coits. Yeah. And then you'll notice that I've slipped in there because this is really special. <laughs> And if we have had a bit of wind noise, I apologise to listeners, but it really has been quite magical sitting outside and listening to the birds and watching the quite changeable weather overhead. But I wish you lots of luck with it and it's a really wonderful place. Keep Thank doing you. what you're doing. Thank you so much for having us. You've been listening to Merlin and Lizzie who have created the most beautiful retreat space in Kabila on Bodmin Moor and their story of how nature helped them recover after burnout and a breakdown and I really hope that their journeys have inspired you as much as they have me. Download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back closer to home next week so join me then.